looking for approval of the agenda. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed the same. Motion carried. Public comment is next. Public, you have three minutes to give us your thoughts. Anybody from the public? Brad? No? Okay. Public comment is closed. Takes us to the minutes of the January 13th meeting. Looking <coughs> for approval. Support. Motion and support. Any changes or corrections? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same. Motion carried. Next up is appointments. Uh, we have appointments to three committees. First is the Community Corrections Advisory Board. There's actually two seats open, and we have an applicant for one of them. Uh, the service area is mental health, public health, substance abuse, and the applicant is John Hayes. Be looking for a motion to send them on to the full board. Support. support. Motion and support. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same. Motion carried. <laughs> the remaining seat will remain open and we'll try and fill it next time. Also, a vacant seat on the Region 2 Planning Commission. No applicants. If there are no nominations from the floor, we'll move to JTA. It's the county rep. Phil Moylanen is the current member. He's the applicant. And I'll vouch for him. He served for a very long time, very well for us. Support. Motion and support. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same. Motion carried. And the upcoming board appointments are there for March as well. Takes us to the prosecutor's semi annual report, Jerry Jarzinka. Good morning. Everyone see that okay? All right. My name is Gabe Down, boy. Down. Good boy. Good boy. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give an update. Uh, really, our six month report finished up last year. Um, okay. Well, if you look at the stats, page one basically warrants reviewed was similar to what we did last year, about 4,600. Um, warrants authorized are about 2,800. Warrants denied, uh, close to 1,900. Uh, most of those warrants authorized were misdemeanors, uh, but they were also felonies as well. If you look at the past years, uh, 2018 were similar numbers, uh, but uh, we see we had some higher numbers uh, in 17 and 16, but we're pretty pretty steady around 4,600 uh, as the number. 2019 cases, the uh, last half of the year that we finished up, we had some major sentencings that occurred. As you can see, uh, Daisha Cooper, uh, that was a homicide case. It was actually a retrial. Um, convicted of involuntary manslaughter, received a sentence of 9 to 15 years. Uh, James Powell, uh, 18 to 40 years. Tracy Ott, that was the case up in Rives Junction uh, where a, uh, a senior citizen had her home broken into uh, by Mr. Ott, um, was tied up. Uh, he then stole her firearms and stole her car, carjacking. So he was convicted. Um, he, had was, he had numerous, numerous felony convictions uh, and he was sentenced to 20 to 40 years. Andrew Martin, that was the case that happened down at the train station uh, where Mr. Martin opened fire into a crowd of people. Uh, thankfully, no one was killed, uh, but he ended up, uh, was found guilty of assault with intent to murder. 25 to 50 years, and Jason Wesh, home invasion case, that was 20 to 40 years as a mutual fourth offender. Amber Reeves, uh, this is a manslaughter case, a child death case, 
um, pled to manslaughter and child abuse in the second degree sentence was 10 to 15 years, uh, which is 10 years was the most you could get as a minimum sentence. Because of Michigan, uh, we are limited. Um, a judge can only give two-thirds of the maximum uh, for a minimum sentence. So even though the maximum may be, in this case, 15 years of manslaughter, you can only get the minimum maximum, which is 10 years. So hence the 10 to 15 years. Continuing on, uh, other sentencing that occurred, Jared Ballard, that was a second degree murder case. Uh, that was the Zachary Fry homicide um, that occurred in the city. Uh, sentence was pretty stiff there, 30 to 60 years. Mark Minor was a CAC first degree uh, sexual assault case. Sentence was 10 to 30. Anthony Harbottle, Hassan Moore, this is a murder two case. Uh, the Morris McBride Jr. homicide that occurred, um, 17 and a half to 40 years. Marlon Davis at the bottom, 23 to 40 years. Uh, that was the case where was a couple kilos of cocaine received a sentence of 23 to 40 years, so two counts of PWID of meth. That was a jury trial with a guilty verdict. The trial docket here for 2020 uh, today is Joanna Taylor and Savannah Frankel is a homicide, the Marvin Bearden homicide. Uh, that trial is anticipated to begin today in front of Judge McBain. Uh, most likely it's going to take the whole week, maybe going to next week. Uh, this occurred um, back on August 30th of 2018. Marquise Smith, that's an assault with intent to murder case. Uh, from July of 2018. And then uh, moving on into uh, March, Anthony Washington, Darka Ross, Charles Wingfield. Uh, Aaron Bankhead is an open murder case. Uh, that was the uh, AutoZone uh, homicide that occurred off of Martin Luther King Drive. Uh, Cordell Brzozowski was the, uh, the victim in that case. Part of our office, we do have a victim's rights unit, and these are just some of the numbers of the office of what they've done this past year. Uh, as you can see, they generated almost 6,000 letters to victims of crime, both uh, felonies and misdemeanor cases. Uh, they had over 2,300 face-to-face interactions with victims in our office. Um, in addition to that, uh, you can see they attended over 1,000 pretrials, motions, parole board hearings, court of appeals, commutation hearings, and jury trials. The 338 numbers basically were assistant prosecutors have met with victims of uh, crime face-to-face. -face. Typically, my policy has been, uh, especially when we have a murder case, uh, I like to meet with the, uh, the victim's family members. Uh, and with our trial team and to talk about the case as much as we can. Obviously, we can't uh, disclose a big chunk of the evidence, but we can answer questions and keep them informed and, uh, as the case begins. Because uh, usually a homicide case normally takes at least a year to go to trial. It could be longer, depending on what happens. We also have a family division uh, off of Lansing Avenue at the health department, friend of the court. And you can see some of the work they did this past year. Uh, they did do meet with uh, custodial, non-custodial parents. And they had 13 hearings, but they also had 488 orders, which not only deals with child support, but also with uh, parenting time or paternity, I should say. Community impact, you know, our office, uh, I encourage our, our staff to be involved in the community, serve on uh, community boards as much as possible. Um, and just this is just a rundown of what I normally do with the office, you know, uh, uh, make myself available for monthly coffee meetings. You know, I had met, you know, once a month at the Roxy Cafe for coffee, but I found it more convenient just to have people, citizens call up by just schedule an appointment, they come to the office. It's convenient for them, too. So in addition to that, uh, we have the, our task force on heroin and prescription drug abuse. Uh, we have our human trafficking task force. Um, 
also participate in the child death review team, uh, child advocacy center, which is CAC, the stakeholders committee, um, the multidisciplinary team, uh, community corrections advisory board, community liaison committee that's with MDOC. And then I serve also on the PAM as the Prosecutor Attorneys Association of Michigan. I, I serve on the cold case homicide committee, the corrections committee, and also the drug initiatives committee. Um, in addition, on the cold case, I'm the chair of that committee uh, for the statewide really pursuit of trying to track down and uh, urge local prosecutors across the state to, uh, to work on cold case homicides. In fact, uh, our committee, uh, part of that is we have a cold case review panel made up of uh, police officers, detectives, and prosecutors. Some are retired. Um, and recently we had a case from last year in Kent County, the Renee Pagel homicide uh, from 2006. Uh, it helped them that uh, recently it was just this past Thursday where they solved that case and actually charged an estranged husband uh, for her murder. Community Impact continued. Um, violent offenders meeting. Um, our office meets monthly with um, the City of Jackson Police Department detective or detectives. Uh, also, JNET, Blackman Township police officers, state police, uh, to work with the city uh, director hit uh, to work with violent offenders. The shootings in the city basically, um, which are primarily, primarily uh, focused on um, members are involved with uh, gang or group activity. Um, so during the summer months, we meet twice a month. And uh, basically, there's five prosecutors on that committee, myself, my chief assistant, and three assistant prosecutors. And basically, um, we keep close tabs on the cases we, we do have uh, for those offenders involved with shootings who we have charged, uh, certainly work tightly to uh, uh, on bond conditions, uh, work very closely as far as making sure we press those charges you know as hard as we can. Um, and so that's been effective, although we've still seen shootings in the city. Last year our homicides were down in the city compared to past years. So I think that's been a very effective group. And also the uh, um, the federal authorities, U.S. Attorney and the Federal agencies, the ATF, have been helpful uh, with, I know, the city and with us uh, to work in that effort as well. The last, uh, the finish up the year, Drug Summit 6 took place uh, in December, um, and uh, that was put on by Drug Free Jackson. The, the prosecutor's office did not put that on this year. We were just in a supporting role. Uh, it was held at Parkside uh, School, and it had some excellent speakers as well. Finally, uh, just an overview of just the different courts that we have to cover uh, with our staff. Um, one thing I don't see listed on there is the Child Advocacy Center. Um, that's a pretty busy place. And so how the schedule works now is Monday through Thursday, they conduct interviews of children who we believe are either sexually or physically abused. Friday is day off, but uh, our office, we have agreed to have an assistant prosecutor there uh, Monday through Thursday morning and afternoon if need be. Police agencies basically pick one of those days to have a detective there, either morning or afternoon. So that's that puts a strain on our office, but it's also been very effective as far as trying to uh, eliminate any kind of backlog of cases where we want kids interviewed at the CAC. Uh, but that in addition to that kind of responsibility, we also have to cover these other different courts. You know, four district courts, three circuit courts with criminal dockets. We have two circuit courts that deal with abuse and neglect dockets, um, child support and paternity, mental health petitions with the hospital, juvenile court, uh, and also our victims' rights unit is part of our office, but they separately function. And uh, I'm sure today they're going to be extremely busy with this trial, uh, the Marvin Bearded Homicide. So that would finish up my report, and I'd open up for any questions you might have um, at this time. Commissioners, any questions? Phil? 
morning, Jerry. Good morning. Uh, who? <clears throat> the, the newspaper doesn't print much anymore. Shootings and overdoses. This has got to be old news. There's somebody that keeps track of the, the whole number. Yes, uh, I believe the sheriff's department keeps track of overdose numbers. Um, my sense is, although we're still having overdose, uh, that uh, compared to you know several years ago, I, I think the trend has been going down. I think nationally, that's the numbers that came out uh, last year showed a trend going downward uh, as far as deaths were concerned. Most, most of the uh, overdose deaths with uh, opioids are related to fentanyl and carfentanyl. Um, with the really the introduction of crystal meth uh, from Mexico, uh, that seems to be uh, trending to the point where that's going to be our number one drug issue. And um, that's helped with the numbers, I think, with overdose deaths. Uh, but we're still, you know, we're battling the, uh, the opioid issue. But there's a lot of good things that have happened. Uh, I know the Andy's Place construction is underway. Uh, it's probably not going to be available uh, for use this year, but it depends on the weather, I suppose. But uh, there's a lot of good things been happening with the opioid issue, in our county at least. Yep. You're welcome. Anything else? Thank you, Chair. Right. Thank you, Chair. All right. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Next up is the emergency management. Jason Brenning. Morning. Good morning. I'm here to, uh, to ask for the approval of the purchase of partial funding for two TrueNart chemical analyzer detectors. Um, this is going to be one for Columbia Township Police Department, the other for the Blackman Leone Township Police Department. A um, little bit of background on the project. Uh, this was presented to our local planning team um, at the January 2020 meeting. Um, and it was passed both by our local Homeland Security Board, uh, the Regional Homeland Security Board, along with the state uh, um, board as well. Um, the global drug problem um, obviously is uh, increasing in threats involving potential terrorist events. is also increasing throughout the, uh, uh, the world. Uh, trafficking of substances and emerging threats like fentanyl and carfentanyl, which obviously we just heard that from Mr. Jarzinka as well, are impacting communities worldwide. Uh, the current analysis cannot be done uh, with, in the field without physically handling the, uh, the unknown types of chemicals. Uh, we're putting our uh, first responders at risk. Um, uh, currently, uh, law enforcement needs to quickly identify these substances to minimize contamination, cross-contamination, and exposure. Um, our current situation, right now we do not have a TrueNARC device in the county that can be deployed 24-7. Uh, one of our uh, JNET uh, does have a device, but it's not available 24/7 as well. Um, law enforcement has to ha heads, excuse me. Law enforcement has to handle, test, package, and transport this unknown these unknown chemicals to the Michigan State Police Crime Lab um, to get a you know positive identification on these, um, or the City of Jackson uh, evidence room. Um, by handling these unknown chemical substances, it increases uh, the exposure and cross-exposure, cross like I had mentioned, thus creating a huge life uh, safety uh, concern. Um, with this project, uh, we have the ability to positively impact every, stand, every strand and area in the county strategic plan with key focuses, focus in the area of safety, or excuse me, safe community and health, healthy community. Uh, for the financial side of this, um, this project would be partially funded uh, with FY 2018 Homeland Security grant funds with a total amount of $31,359. The remainder of this project um, will be paid by the housing agencies, each of one Columbia Township Police Department and the other Blackman Leone uh, uh, Department of Public Safety. Um, each device costs $29,640. Uh, the total project for this, or the total uh, project amount is $59,280. Uh, that breaks down to portion funded by each housing agency 
of $13,960. So I'm here to request that uh, our portion is funded through Homeland Security funds of $31,359. So Jason, just to be clear or to reiterate, it's passed through dollars, correct? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. Yep. And second thing is that it's approved at the committee level, correct? Yes, sir, it is. And the third thing is, if no commissioner has a problem with it, I'm going to abstain from voting on it. It's obviously Columbia Township, but as long as nobody's got an objection to that. Tony? I had a question. If uh, 31359 is covered by a grant in Columbia and Blackman reach covering 13960 there's no cost to the county on this, then? No cost to the county? Correct. Okay, so you're not asking for any additional funding? No, sir. Just approval to go ahead with it? Yes, sir. That's a no-brainer. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, if there's no additional questions, we'd be looking for a motion. Some motion and support. I'll be abstaining, but all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same. Motion carried. Thank you, Jason. Thank you all. Next up is the 911 quarterly report. Jason Hammond, good morning. Good morning. So this year, or, or I'm sorry, last year, uh, dispatch uh, answered a total of 217,573 911 calls into dispatch, um, which is up about 5.3% uh, from 2018. Uh, we also called stock for any accidents on the highways um, approximately 345 times last year. Um, stock kind of leads the way with protecting the first responders and trying to get the accidents resolved as quickly as possible. Um, dispatch also did 156 phone pings last year. Some were successful and some were not. Um, our goal live with our CAD upgrade is February 25th. Upgrades to other softwares will include records, mobiles, and correctional uh, software as well. We've had trainings. Um, with all the law enforcement and corrections already. I also did 74 FOIAs from the citizens and law firms last year and about 143 different ones from law enforcement and prosecutors as well. Last year we took a total of 186 text message calls since we went live back in uh, August. I think that's been a huge success for Jackson County, a way to protect the citizens that can't speak. As the, the data goes, I, uh, oops, sorry. Gives you a breakdown from 2018 to 2019 calls per month. Um, we've had some of the busy months during the summertime. Um, and it kind of slows down in the wintertime a little bit. I do not. I mean, the increases in the summertime, people are up a little bit later, so we get more calls in the evening. Or in the, sum, in the wintertime, they get up a little bit earlier, but 6, 7 o'clock for travel time. But during the summertime, it's got kids out, school, um, and the youth. I do not know. I'll just Use your microphone. And the, then the, 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 the call breakdown by like wire line, which is the old uh, copper lines, the old uh, phones in the houses versus voice phones, uh, SMS textings, uh, and wireless. And you see wireless is pretty much used almost 90% here in Jackson County versus the other types. Uh, 
And also, this is the amount of calls each department took last year. Uh, as you can see, we use a lot of different fire departments in Jackson County for mutual aid service. Um, in the south region and north region, more so. But um, those are the total. And the total calls was 147,281 calls last year for uh, different incidents. And then just go through some of the trainings that we uh, finished up last year, last year on. Um, some of the most notable ones with the mental health dispatching. Um, suicide calls that come into dispatch, we will spend anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes on a phone call with them. Um, and so it's uh, important that the staff understand those calls and understand what to do and try to keep the caller on the line until uh, the first responders get there. Then Strive and Thrive. That is a way for dispatch to relax, how to de-stress de from those uh, important calls. And then the breakdown of some of the call types. Um, animal calls from last year to 2018, you can see we've increased animal calls by animal control. They've been very helpful, especially in the past year, um, helping out with the citizens a little bit more than um, just going for cat and dog calls. So I really appreciate Lydia and her team for that. And then the fire department calls as well. Um, different fire alarms, structure fires. Jay Jason, on the animal calls, yes. is that inclusive of calls handled by police agencies when the ACOs are not in service, or is this just exclusive for them? This inclusive for animal control. Okay. Also, uh, law enforcement's some of the more, more predominant calls they go on, the domestic si situations, uh, traffic violations, hazards, disorderlies, uh, personal welfare checks, and traffic stops. Traffic stops from last year went up a uh, good portion, four or 5,000 more traffic stops, tickets. And then just a broader view of all the calls uh, in dispatch. Um, as far as call types go, so you guys kind of see the more dominant calls versus the other ones. You guys have any questions? I've got one. Okay. Jason, is EMD being talked about still by fire departments or fire chiefs or not? Yes, we still have an ad hoc committee going on from the 911 advisory board. Uh, Tim McEldowney is in charge of that, so we are still discussing that. But I know he's had a few trips planned, so we haven't been able to meet okay. uh, last month. Thank you. Welcome. And you wanted to talk also, I think, about the PFN incident? Yes. So on the 31st, we have the 9 -1 outage. Um, when statewide, it affected 102 PSAPs, about 3.3 million citizens. Uh, and they did find out, it, we were down for about five hours in total. J Jackson County, we were a little different. We, we didn't totally go down as far as our 911 calls. We still had our, we still haven't converted over on two of our carriers to the PFN. So we still had two carriers that were still sending calls to us on the old trunk lines. Um, everything else was going to PFN, so we lost all those calls. I'd say lost, but I actually came in and we actually were able to retrieve all the Andy and Alley information, which is the phone numbers that come through, like a caller ID. So we actually called callers back to at least get them the help that was needed. Um, so according to, according to my calculations, we didn't miss any calls in Jackson. We called them back. We got them the help that, that, that they need. I'm still waiting on a, on a document from PFN. So I can cross-reference what calls we had in dispatch. Um, and so I can make sure that we didn't miss any calls. Um, the letter that they will be sending out to the media, I have a copy of it here if you guys don't mind if I read it. Uh, a PFN optical transit nod restored from a power event in a corrupted manner causing the internet ring protection to fail and creating a loop in the network. These loops are what consumed all the bandwidth 
and interrupt the services until engineering could repair the cards, manually switch the traffic. PFN engineers are performing a software restart, which brought the corrupted module back to normal state. So <laughs> that's what we're going to put out to the media from, <laughs> from the, pretty much the bandwidth just got filled up and could process nothing else through it. So Jason, is there anything that you can see that we could do? Well, let me back up. So if that system is down and there's an emergency that somebody needs to contact to get emergency services, they're left with with what? Texting still worked. If Texting still worked. Right. We still have our admin lines. Our admin lines, I didn't switch over to PFN. I wanted them separate just in case of this incident. So when we, I sent out a cold red early in the morning advising people to call this number, these numbers for our admin lines, those are still separate. Um, and I kept them separate for just this particular reason in case this ever happened. Um, we also have our Mevo phones, but when the whole network went down like that, our Mevo phones did not work as well, as well as the rest of the state. Um, from my meeting last Friday, there is still PSAPs in Michigan still having major issues. Um, we are not one of them. We're not a hosted site. We have a, a, a standalone unit, which is back in dispatch. Um, places that have a hosted site are having still issues. Lenawee County, Hillsdale County, Calhoun, Kalamazoo, Shiawassee, they're all from this part of the area. They're all still having uh, 911 outages. So is there something that we could do in the future to make sure the public knows what these alternate numbers are if something happens again? And I think, if I recall right, you did code red as well. We did cold red. I sent a, 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 an outlet out to the media as well, um, so they have them. Um, I think I'm going to place a couple of, of those admin line numbers on our website. So that way if they get on the website, they can they know the admin lines to call, or we'll call them non-emergency lines to help the citizens as well. Um, and then we'll try to make sure we get notice out to the citizens as quick as we can. Also trying to have the state um, also do this when they have an outage like this, that the state pushes the information out to all the citizens. I may have missed it, but do you think it's fair to say that there were no life safety emergencies that were missed during that time? From my calculations, no, but I want to double check once I get all the stats back from the PFN. Okay. Commissioners, Phil? The failure, failure of the 800 system, is it simply that they were overwhelmed with the number of calls that come in at that hour? I mean, you read your your news release, but didn't mean much to me. Um, the network itself, um, the company actually had a power failure, and the power failure corrupted the network itself, so it clogged all the fiber lines, so nothing could get through to the PSAPs. It was more of a power failure problem instead of a numbers problem, like the number of calls coming in. I'm wondering if the number of counties that have switched over to the 800 system is starting to overburden the 800 system, the state, the state system. Phil, this was the phone system, actually, not the 800 radio system. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions, commissioners? Hearing none. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You guys have a nice day. Next up is the Public Defender Quarterly Report. We don't have, um, we're in a period of transition. Our Public Defender has resigned and uh, moved on to a different position. The position is posted. So I just wanted to give a brief verbal update um, that we are looking for a new Chief Public Defender. Um, we have furniture at the 505 South Jackson location, which will be the new office. Um, it arrived Friday, so Friday and today they are assembling furniture. We're hoping by the end of the week that the staff will be able to move in there. Um, I'm attending a meeting tomorrow with regard to a dispute over f some funding um, in Lansing, so I will be at the MIDC meeting tomorrow. Um, I think my, Mike is coming as well for a period of time, I think. Um, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any questions. Commissioners, any questions of Deb on public defender? Tony. And then Darius. If a uh, exit interview was conducted with our public chief public defender, 
Did he list the reasons that he was leaving so soon? Um, I don't have the results of the exit interview. That's not shared, so I don't have the results, but I do know what he told me is he was offered a position in St. Clair County, which is where he had his law firm. So he basically went back home. <laughs> um, he was offered the same position in St. Clair County. So he didn't have to sell his house and move and um, relocate here. He stayed home, basically. Okay, didn't have anything to do with the... Uh The way certain judges were interacting with the new public defenders? Um, not that I'm aware of. Unfortunately, that occurs. Um, I've seen it and experienced after 26 years in the court system. It's not a unique situation. I, I don't know specifically, um, but unfortunately that happens. Deb, wasn't it true that his house was for sale up there and he hadn't sold it in the time that he Correct. was here? He so. had indicated to me over the course of his employment with us that his house was for sale. Um, he had put it on, on the market and had been on the market for quite some time, but it hadn't sold yet. So, Okay. Tony, are you good? Oh, Darius? Do we have anyone to serve in the interim? We have a deputy chief. So we do have a deputy chief who is assuming responsibilities. And if I can type. And are we currently receiving any uh, resumes or applications for the position? Yes, it is posted on our website, on SCAO's website, and Indeed. And um, I don't know the exact amount of applications, but I have seen a few come oh, through so we've from Indeed. Some. Okay. Yeah, so the, it is open. It has been open, gosh, for a week and a half, maybe okay. two weeks. So okay. it has been open. Yeah. You know when that window will close and then we, we can start interviews? Um, I asked, I'm actually going on vacation next week, so I asked <coughs> HR to keep it open while I'm gone okay. so that we can keep accepting <coughs> those applications when I'm back. Then we'll start sifting through them and doing the interviews. Okay. So like in two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. Uh, thank you. Nothing further. Bill? Deb, has the uh, public defender's office actually been up and running and doing its work? So they, we've been leaving Bill, can you? Phil, can you use your mic, please? Oh, it is. <coughs> okay. Has the public defender's office been up and active in doing the job they were intended to do, or are we still leaning on the, the contracted uh, defense attorneys? So we have been doing some of the work. They have been doing arraignments. One of the requirements for the state is to do arraignments, to appear at arraignments. Um, and they have been doing that at all the correctional facilities and the court. They've been doing misdemeanor and felony arraignments, so they are doing that portion of it. Unfortunately, due to the dispute with the state that I will be appearing for tomorrow, as well as the location, they didn't have offices to meet in a secure and confidential environment with litigants. Um, we haven't been able to have a full case representation. March 1st, it is expected that they will start accepting cases with the district court. So they will start um, handling from two of the judges at district court, they will start handling a portion of the caseload there. Um, but they needed offices for confidential conversations to meet with individuals. And, um, and then, like I said, we're resolving hopefully a dispute tomorrow with the state on some funding. So um, then we can begin moving forward to complete our compliance. As you know, I didn't support the whole concept, but I guess it is what it is. Yeah, just real quick, how long was the, or I guess previous um, chief deputy on the job? The chief public defender? Yes, he started, I, I said chief deputy, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, he started end of July or beginning of August. He started on a part-time basis. He was um, uh, in private practice. So he had to close his practice down, which can be quite a cumbersome feat. So um, he was part-time through the beginning of September. So he worked about five or six weeks part-time, and then September he came on full-time. Okay. Do we, know that, do we know if his practice was officially closed at all? Um, that's what he told me. I, I didn't confirm anything. I didn't check into it. So that's what I was advised. All right. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Deb? Go ahead. Good morning, Deb. Good morning. I'm uh, just curious. Um, the the dispute with the the state right now is that in reference to the to the transport officers, and uh, I heard they were asking for some money back. Yes, they. Um, 
we have an approved fiscal year 2019 and fiscal year 2020 plan. In both of those plans, we have approved two correction deputies, and um, we began the process of hiring those correction deputies. They have been hired, one of them, I believe, since October of 2019, no, 2018. And um, the state, after the fact, is now telling us that they won't pay for the training, which is a mandatory, I, I double-checked with the undersheriff, it's a mandatory, mandatory seven-month training through the state of Michigan that is required similar to a police officer who has to be MCOL certified. The correction deputies have a seven-month training that is um, required through the state. So MIDC is telling us that they will not pay for the training, um, the seven-month training of those two individuals. So, but we found that they have covered that training in other communities. Good, Daniel. Okay. Okay, if no additional questions, yeah, I know, time's wasting, right, Phil? Uh, Deb, thanks for covering for that. Uh, Under Sheriff Cole with the annual Tyler Technologies Maintenance and Support Invoice. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners, Administrators. Um, I'm here before you looking for approval to uh, move forward with the payments to Tyler Technologies, but I do have to declare or inform you in full transparency that because of a confusion and miscommunication with myself and finance, this actually payment has already gone through. It had to do with the fact that the director, 9-1 director's module was already approved within his upgrade assignment. Um, these fees were to some degree separate. I asked finance to hold these until board of commissioners approval, but my uh, interaction with them was not very clear. I accept responsibility for that. So if the board chooses not to pursue these, then we would obviously seek recovery for the months in which the uh, module was not used, but this is the recurring yearly payment. It's obviously above the threshold at $88,000 and change um, requiring board approval. This is for the maintenance upgrades and software uh, items that IT would use um, should the databases need to be updated, things like that. This covers all of the correctional management software, which is how we book prisoners, house prisoners, um, track incident reports with prisoners, etc. And then all of the law enforcement records and databases that all the police agencies within Jackson County use. Those obviously seamlessly work together with the 911 dispatch. Uh, module so our information can carry from call inception to police report to arrest if there is one so uh, these will come out of the budget funds for um, either sheriff law enforcement operations or sheriff jail operations depending on the um, specific amount for that module the total cost is eighty eight thousand five hundred and eighty eight cents okay albeit after the fact uh, it pretty much sells itself I think Right. I mean, it's a savings over prior years. Right? That's correct. Okay, commissioners, any questions? Tony. Get the mic. I said this eighty-eight thousand includes twenty-eight thousand. That is to other agencies, but they don't reimburse us for it. So initially, as we all came onto the system um, countywide, uh, there was a certain number of licenses that were required, certain number of workstations, um, all of these uh, fees built into the system, and in order to have an economy as a scale, we needed everybody on that. So yes, to some degree, um, this, there's $28,000 allocated to other agencies for the base licenses, things like that. But this is not a escalation of commitment because any time an agency moves forward and wants to add on to either more licenses, more workstations, whatever it may be, they pay their own way. So this is kind of the, the baseline. This is what we supply. We're happy to do that because obviously, like I kind of uh, displayed here, that having everybody in one system where investigators can access everybody's records at the, you know, the click of a button, I have access to everyone else's records as they have access to all of our records, including our correctional records, that makes uh, your job as an investigator or trying to track somebody down well worth that $28,000. We're glad to shoulder that kind of baseline module. And again, that's from way back, gosh, where we've been with New World now for better than 10 or 12 years. Um, so that's probably, you know, a lot of that has kind of fallen off, but as they agencies begin to move on and add, they pay their own way. So this is not uh, some further commitment that we're going to make as it continues to go and go and go. Okay. And this $88,500 is in your current budget. 
That's correct. Uh, the service oh. contracts and maintenance of computer items that are currently budgeted in the county jail and county law enforcement operations. So it's no new costs that we weren't already anticipating. That's correct. We pay these each year. <clears throat> Thank you. Tony, only one additional sales pitch for it is that it integrates things from dispatch into the police reports, into jail management. Uh, when an officer makes a traffic stop, it integrates that data from a license swipe directly into the call, and it's all part of the system that is provided here for everybody in the county, so, other than the state police, correct? Correct. So. Okay, Phil? Yes, this is just the yearly maintenance fees like you'd have with most other software contracts. Uh, there is obviously an evolution and upgrade to this system coming. Um, that was part of the 9-1 director's project. Uh, some of these other, what I'll call tentacles, that um, the dispatch system reaches will have an enhancement because of that, and we'll have some upgrades. <clears throat> okay, looking for a motion, and goes to the full board. Motion and support. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same. Motion carried. Sheriff, purchase of four police utility interceptor patrol cars. They're getting expensive. <laughs> Indeed they are. Uh, so I'm here asking for the, uh, the approval to purchase four Ford police interceptor or what are commonly known as Explorer patrol vehicles from Signature Ford on a competitive government bid. Price per vehicle is 36404 Total purchase 145616 I attached the bid from the government bid that we were using showing all the options that we were selecting on that vehicle so you could clearly see. Again, this has a caveat within here because the finance officer under the general government committee will be requesting a budget amendment. So if that budget amendment is not so uh, approved by the, by the commission or by the subcommittee, then this will be kind of for not. But I'm here asking for this approval. Um, obviously, we have a number of vehicles, as you all know. Uh, we lost two vehicles last year to non at fault accidents as they were totaled out by the insurance carrier. We did receive some insurance funds for those, although not nearly enough to replace the entire vehicle. That was placed into the capital improvement account, um, along with some of these leftover funds from 2019 that the finance officer is going to be requesting an amendment to move. And the two other vehicles that would be replaced, as you can see on the last page, are currently in township assignments. Uh, obviously, our contracts with townships uh, for law enforcement services, a portion of those revenues that are coming in fund patrol vehicles. Uh, other than that, this is just the general replacement cycle of vehicles that we, that we have each year. And typically, we have been purchasing Dodge products in the past. Uh, Dodge is no longer... There's a problem with Dodge's manufacturers. They switched to a different platform, and the Dodge Chargers are no longer available this year and won't be available until approximately late, 20, late 2020 or early 2021. So we're kind of left in the situation of having to buy the Ford uh, Explorers, which are a little more expensive, although they, I think they are more of a robust vehicle. Uh, so that's why we're requesting four of those instead of the Dodge products we had in the past. Chris, just a couple of questions for me. Uh, one, I'm disappointed in the price of the things, not your fault. And I think you're going on the Macomb County bid, correct? That's correct. And it was just, I think, a year or two ago at most, we were paying $26,000 for the same vehicle. That is and correct. As I read through your proposal, it looks like you're uh, purchasing it or planning to purchase it upfitted with a lot of the equipment already. Yes, we use um, emergency vehicle upfitters in Kalamazoo as our kind of our final upfitter, and they had recommended uh, this specific package because most of the harness is already in. They can do a lot of the plug and play, uh, where essentially they just have to drop the cages and the center councils in. They can plug a lot of the aftermarket equipment in directly to those harnesses instead of having to cut into the actual. Uh, what I would call factory vehicle wiring. Uh, to them, they said it's a lot, it, it makes their upfitting costs a lot more inexpensive and makes the turnaround time a lot faster. So that'll mean that we have left to buy the screen, the cage, and the plastic seat probably, and then pay them to install those things and the console, correct? That is correct. Okay. <coughs> Commissioners, any other questions? Tony? And then Darius? All right, the purchase of the four vehicles is 145000 Six hundred sixteen dollars. I know that one hundred forty-four thousand one hundred sixty-eight is already in your budget. Um, you talk about a grant, uh, the SRP grant, thirty-four thousand eight hundred forty. So if you've got a grant covering some of this cost, what's the final actual cost you're asking for? So. <clears throat> 
let's take that one one piece at a time here. So uh, we did receive a allotment, an increased allotment from Secondary Road Patrol. And in the past, they had generally uh, not approved vehicles. We had sought approval to purchase, for the most part, um, most of the vehicle with the amount of 34840 coming from the Secondary Road Patrol funds, which will be part of the financers, finance officer's uh, budget amendment as well. <clears throat> So part of that is going to be funded by the grant, but that will be in the ro in the secondary road patrol budget. The final amount for purchase of vehicles uh, total coming from the county's ap accounts payable would be one forty five six one six. It's just instead of um, all one forty five six one six coming from the capital improvement plan, uh, thirty thirty four eight forty is going to come from that secondary road patrol budget to supplement m the majority of that vehicle. And if I can interject a question, Chris, where did the wrecked vehicles fit into that financial equation then? <coughs> we were reimbursed separately on those? Correct. We were reimbursed separately on those, and we received from the insurance carrier $16,000 and change for the two vehicles, uh, about seven for one and eight for another. <coughs> Tony, back to you. More? All right, so I'm still not clear in my head. We've got a cost for four new vehicles, which you need. We've got some insurance reimbursement for the ones that were totaled out, and we've got some grant money. And we've got money in the budget for this. I'm still not putting all three of these together. What, do, what dollar amount do you really need to purchase these vehicles? The total dollar amount to purchase the vehicles check coming from the county of Jackson to signature Ford will be 145616 okay so there's approximately $16,000 and change in the capital improvement fund already um, there's approximately 103 and change that the finance officers are going to request to move and the remaining 34840 would come from the secondary road patrol budget now keep in mind that the total purchase price of 145616 only includes the vehicle acquisition. There's other upfitting costs that are paid afterwards to uh, vehicle upfitters and things like that for uh, the equipment to be put on and in the vehicle. But to answer your question, if if perhaps I'm not being clear, but the County of Jackson would need to pay signature Ford 145616, and a portion of that's going to come from capital improvement, and the 34 uh, and changes as stated earlier would come from the secondary road patrol budget to make up that 145. Okay, thank you. Darius. I'm done. Okay, if everybody's clear, we'd be looking for a motion to send it on to the full board. So moved. Motion and support. All those in favor saying five by saying aye. All right, those opposed the same, motion carried. <clears throat> Under Sheriff Cole, the Sheriff year-end report. Yes, so um, I provided you an advanced copy and hopefully in all your mailboxes, I provided them to Delane. Uh, I can do one of two things. We can either go through this um, page by page or if you would just like to go directly to any sections that you have questions on, we can do it that way. Um, your time is of my greatest concern, so whatever your pleasure may be. Chris, I did go through it I would just suggest you hit maybe some of the highlights on it and if commissioners have questions they can feel free I think it's what 40 pages it is but I tried to do a different uh, format this year and provide you some historical information um, with some graphs and quick information at a look instead of a lot of narrative uh, but then I found out that the uh, the size of the document made it um, a bit much to attach to board docs, so some of the graphs in here are a little blurry, which is hence why you got a uh, printed copy in your mailbox with advance notice. So um, I guess some of the other things, uh, some of the quick things that maybe you haven't seen before is now we report um, use of force incidences to the FBI. Uh, they have a portal, uh, portal through that where we report that yearly. So we started to include some of that data, which generally talks about um, our type of responses, uh, what type of responses that we encounter, and then what type of follow-up use of force, whether it be with a, um, a non-lethal weapon like a taser or a chemical irritant, um, or whether it's just physical force. <clears throat> so you're going to see some of that information in there. Also armed versus unarmed, and then, of course, uh, the number of individuals that are under the influence or not under the influence or, um, frankly, status unknown. Uh, Janet's uh, 
number of arrests and seizures are in there again, um, as we do a yearly to provide kind of a look back, and we try to provide a historical look as far as what was going on as far as their activity, seizures, and things of that nature. Again, significant incidences, you can look through these, I won't read them uh, case by case or verbatim, uh, but they continue to do a lot of good work as far as making inroads to higher level dealers, and obviously we're finding, as which is not a surprise, a lot of firearms uh, directly related to these. Our Marine Patrol hours, including our border safety courses and, and livery inspections, and uh, thankfully we only had two very minor boating accidents this year, uh, search and rescue operations. And there you can see the number of uh, apparatuses or boats that we have assigned to Marine Patrol. <clears throat> Our mounted division hours, obviously, uh, their biggest use is at the Cascade Fireworks and at the fair. FOIA requests continue to be uh, very, um, well, they've, they've leveled out over the last couple of years, but we're processing a uh, number of FOIAs and what really makes things difficult is almost all of our FOIAs require some kind of redaction, whether it be video, um, reports, things like that. So we're spending a lot of time redacting information requested by the public. <coughs> Fingerprints still fairly steady between the last couple of years. <coughs> Hit a high water mark, obviously, there in 2016. And uh, the license to purchase firearms is coming down a little bit, although it stayed pretty, pretty level. A uh, number of reserves hour, or number of reserve hours for 2019. Um, again, a lot of the events that uh, go on in this community could not have been done without them, so we appreciate their effort. Very little cost to the county on that. I uh, wanted to kind of clearly lay out here uh, where our staffing was for the schools and, and who we were in partnership with what school districts. Uh, I know there's been a lot of discussion on that in the past, so hopefully um, if I have this in here as a historical document, if there's any questions, you can kind of go back and reflect upon that. And we included some information from them this year, too, about what kind of activity they're doing in the school, criminal versus non-criminal, um, assistant school staff, things of that nature. <clears throat> And the joint SRT team between ourselves, uh, city police, Blackman Leone, a uh, number of significant cases <clears throat> that they were involved in, their expertise and resources and equipment helped bring to a uh, successful conclusion. Uh, Violent Crimes Task Force, this is again, uh, we have one deputy uh, allocated to this task force. This is in conjunction with the uh, city police, Blackman Leone, and the state police. And their main directive is removing violent offenders from the city streets and um, assisting uh, Jackson police detectives with closing some of these violent crimes cases. We've moved to a online uh, training academy, uh, which allows us to get some of our training hours in uh, remotely or done online. Um, all these courses are MCOLs approved and certified. <clears throat> some additional um, equipment to the total station, which allows us to document forensic scenes, whether it be fatality and serious injury traffic crash scenes or crime scenes, allows us to uh, map those a little bit more accurately and provide a much richer image to uh, juries and to the prosecutor's office in the case of these major events. Uh, G2G online payments, um, we've moved to that shortly after the end of the year with the IT's help. Uh, that has gone very seamless. We don't have any problems and so far the uh, system seems to be working very well. You are all well aware that we've been engaged with LifeWays uh, and stepping up for mental health, uh, kind of a mental health initiative, providing dedicated resources to inmates in the county jail, partially thanks to the millage. We now have a second caseworker at Channel Road, uh, so we are getting a uh, lot of help from those staff at both facilities, intervening in a lot of the uh, crisis health situations and the everyday health situations that uh, require some mental health insight and know-how. We also are involved in a partnership with Wayne State about um, opioid use and uh, getting those individuals who are in the county jail who may have addictive traits or may have come in addicted to opioid use, uh, kind of some connection to resources once they leave jail so they're not just thrown back on the street and fall back, back into their addictive uh, past history here. And we've been working closely with the uh, public Defender's Office, and that has gone very well. We've had many meetings with them. They are doing uh, pretrial visits and um, assist, uh, attending the arraignments of individuals. Um, every day they're at both jails, uh, Wesley Street and Chandler Road, that has gone absolutely fabulous. 
uh, good people to work with, and we've had very little hiccups with that. Um, we've got all the credentials to get them into the facilities. Uh, retention and recruiting, we've talked about that. It just seems to be uh, there's a little bit of a Fortunately, we've hit a little bit of law right now, but uh, this seems to be statewide. Uh, there's just not a lot of applicants coming in, um, especially when you start talking about minority applicants into the law enforcement realm. Uh, we just need to kind of continue to avail ourselves of continuing trends and try to evolve ourselves as best we can. Um, but it's just we're competing with a lot of other municipalities out there and other agencies that are hiring as well. Uh, we're trying to streamline our FOIA uh, process like I talked about earlier and working with IT on that. Um, they have a couple ideas, and so we're open to kind of streamlining and making anything more efficient um, with their input. Uh, and I put some things on here that either have been or will be in the capital improvement plan. Uh, we're talking about Wesley Street building security and the proxy card access, um, something that uh, we're the only building that uh, does not have that. So that's something we would like to look to change to move to. Uh, our MDCs are moving towards the end of life uh, in order to account for the new level of software that IT will be moving towards with some of these updates. We'll need to replace those in the coming future. Uh, they're about 13 years old. Uh, we have a stock of parts left right now that we're kind of utilizing, but they are really at the end of life. And same thing with the in-car uh, in camera system. That server and those technologies are coming towards the end of life. And, and so again, I'm just kind of putting this on the radar for the capital improvement plan. So when you see these things come, maybe you'll say, okay, I remember you guys talking about that. Uh, we want to move to a more sure. inline system. Yes, sir. Chris, there is that. I just had a quick question on the, um, the computer system you were just referring to. Yes. Now, is that in addition to the computer that's in the car, or is this... The, or is this the same system? So this, the, what I'm talking about here with the mobile data computers would yeah. be the in-car computer okay. where they receive our dispatches, they uh, start the process of police reporting, uh, they receive their routing um, or communications from dispatch. Uh, there's a number of things they do on it. Actually, they do most things on it. And that's how it integrates with the database uh, to send the information back to the main servers. Okay. Um, they're just very old. Uh, the, the operating platform on them, I think, is Windows 7. Okay, uh, so it, it, it's a very old platform and they're just their end of life. I mean, a typical life cycle for a computer, I think, is about five to seven years. Maybe IT might say different, but these are 13 years old. They've done well. They continue to do well. It's just we can't get parts for them anymore, and gotcha. it's just one of these things that needs to be transitioned. Gotcha. Okay, I just wanted to be sure I had that right. Yes, sir. Chris, are they part of a capital improvement project or not yet, those and or the in-car camera systems? Uh, so they were, and I know because of the difficulties that the county has had, um, they've been moved off uh, for some future time, uh, and I guess we'll, we'll revisit that when that capital cycle comes around this year and kind of uh, elevate uh, a number of those projects based on our need to what their priority is, and then obviously that will be dependent on what, what the uh, funding is available. And same thing with the tasers, uh, those are becoming end of life, obviously been a very useful tool, but uh, they are beginning to not support uh, a certain number of tasers that we have as far as um, accepting responsibility for the updates, accepting responsibility for the repairs, and then most importantly, um, accepting any type of liability um, for the devices and any type of uh, injuries or uh, lawsuits they might result in. So that will obviously be something that we need to upgrade. We've been slowly upgrading these a number of a, at a time, so we do have some of the newer models, uh, but for the most part, all of our current tasers are the old style. Female inmate population. Uh, this continues to be a very severe issue for us. Uh, obviously, Wesley Street is only really designed to hold a maximum of 62. Uh, we've been uh, well above that for a number of days this year. As you can see, 80.7 was our average. That is astronomical. Uh, this does not appear to be a trend that's going to reverse itself. We have some room within the jail where we've begun to move uh, people around and do some different things as far as holding. The problem becomes is that um, our second floor population is most of the violent crimes individuals from the city from rival gangs that we're trying to make inroads with. So we can't move those people within uh, eyesight of each other or certainly within the same tanks as a result of a lot of physical altercations. So we're really limited on movement. We have two proposals before the uh, district and circuit judges, which would be premature for me to talk about, which may make some inroads here without having to invest, um, obviously, significant capital dollars to somehow 
you know, add on or, or add um, housing capacity. We're hopeful that they'll see the benefit in some of these um, alternative ideas that we have as far as incarceration for some of these individuals. I will say the court has been very good. Uh, we have repeatedly got them the uh, inmate uh, population as far as women are concerned and those that were releasable they were releasing them for us uh, but there's just some some women within the population who are not releasable they're there on capital crimes or serious crimes and they just can't be released so we are working very closely and frequently with the court to try to stem this and to try to get some of these individuals released uh, I see that our inmate female inmate population was down pretty well this morning so um, but I don't see this trend reversing itself and again, I think you're all aware, but we use a number of social media platforms and continue to try to uh, utilize those and leverage some of the capacities that we have. We receive a lot of information um, via Facebook and Twitter, uh, both outbound information that we're putting on there and then also information coming back from people. Uh, a number of good tips this year has led to um, identifying some individuals, so it is a very worthwhile endeavor for us, and we appreciate IT supporting us in those efforts. And that is all I have. Okay, any questions for the undersheriff? Darius. It's yeah, one last question for you. The uh, mobile speed signs, can those be used in the city of Jackson? You know, that's a great question. And I would, my initial reaction would say probably not because they were bought with a secondary road patrol grant um, or secondary road patrol funding. But, um, there's a number of areas which that may be possible. So I'm going to have to check into that and get back with you. Okay, thank you. And if there's a specific location, then um, yes, I think we probably could. Okay. So I will get the definitive answer on that and let you know. Thank you. And th lastly on that, does those, the signs, do they take pictures of speeding cars or anything like that? Nope. So all it does is provide us data back um, as far as time of day, average speed, high speed, low speed, um, that type of thing. So just really just data. Data. Um, doesn't okay. take any pictures of any vehicles or any identifying information. It just gives us an idea of is the enforcement needed in this location or is everyone complying with the speed and, and what are our kind of all the outliers, the highs and the lows. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Thank you. <coughs> Nothing further. Okay, any other questions? Tony. Uh, another question. To, uh, thank you. I see we've got between the dive team, the mounted division, and the reserve unit, we've got 39 volunteers, uh, good professionals to provide a great service for the county. Just like to pass on to them. Thank you. It's very well said. Agreed, and I will pass that along to them. They are uh, great individuals, and they offer a lot of time and effort, and uh, they seem to enjoy it. Okay. No additional questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciated the layout of the report. Yes, I, uh, I think it was, I hope it was more beneficial yes, than, than the traditional PowerPoint. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up is JC down with a truck mounted attenuator. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. All right, so the first item we have is the truck mounted attenuator, which is the collision truck that's behind our crews when they're out filling potholes and stuff. It absorbs impact in an event of an accident. Um, and actually in September, the one did get hit on I-94. So we went through MMRMA um, with that and they had an adjuster look at it and they gave us a price of 23, just over 23,000. And with our team, we researched a brand new one is just over 26,000. So we are asking the board to approve at committee us purchasing the new one with only about $3,500 of JCDOT's money um, going towards the new one. But then we will pay the additional cost to repair the one that was damaged for a total JCDOT expenditure of $18,958.90. So Angie, this is just the equipment that goes on the back of the truck, correct? It's an actual right. truck. Um, you drive it, so it's got that, it's like a cushion type thing Passing. that's attached yeah. at the back and an arrow board above it. So it's the entire truck. This is the truck. whole truck and everything? Yes. Okay. Commissioners, any questions of Angie on this? And I'm assuming everybody has seen one of these on the highway before. So, okay, it gets approved at committee level. We'd be looking for approval. And Angie, one last thing, you're going to try and do repairs to the old one in-house. Is that the plan, potentially? Is it in-house? I think I read that somewhere, did I not? No, it's 15000 no, it Okay, yeah, I thought I it see. was going. Okay. So we'd be looking for a motion for approval here. Oh. So the dollar 
correct? Correct. Correct. Three total, but one hat isn't in the game here, so yep. So to be clear, the amount is twenty six thousand five fifty nine thirty, correct? Um yeah. Yes, and but re that that's the amount going out and we have other amounts coming in from the insurance company. Correct. So accurate? Yep. Okay. Tony, you clear on that? So that that amount in the board pack at twenty six five fifty nine thirty would be minus the adjustment from the insurance company. So we'll pay that out and get a check from the insurance right. company. Yeah, the $23,000, right? right? Just over 23000 $3, Correct, but we have to pay for the new one first and then get reimbursed. Right. In the end, Tony, that's an accurate amount. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Is there a support? Go ahead, Phil. It's hopefully the last vehicle on the line, right? Well, it's the first one traffic comes to in a moving operation, typically. So if they're out filling potholes, um, we use that to protect our guys. I don't know what classification it is for our You can ask the next committee chairman that question, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay, sorry. Okay, any other questions? No. Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same. Motion carried. JC. Elm Road and West Ave Interchange. All right, so this one, um, back in 2018, we worked with the board to um, get additional JCDOT covered funds for the I-94 Cooper enhancement for the interchange. Um, and at that time, we talked about the fact that when they do their um, interchanges with the roundabouts, there'd probably be additional costs to um, have the improvements that we wanted. And then at the West Ave I-127 interchange, the diverging diamond, that there'd be additional costs to beautify those projects. So in your packet, you've got the signs, um, the diverging sign, that it's option two, the rounded top. Um, that we're asking to have cost share in. And then at the uh, I-94 Elm roundabouts, the ones closest to the highway, uh, there's a picture of what it will look like. It's basically like the Cooper, but it says Jackson in it. Um, and the, those two projects, the total cost that JCDOT would have um, for the enhancements would be uh, $513,087.04. Questions? And Angie, this is money that is budgeted in the road department? Yeah, it's in the, the bond that we just did in 2019, the road bond. Okay, Commissioners, first, any questions of Angie on what's proposed, and this does go to the full board? And if there are none, then we'd be looking for a motion. Cost was... The total cost was how much? The total cost between 13. the two. I can break them down for you. So for the Elm Road interchange, it's the $187,335.50. And that's the county's portion, correct? The county's portion. Right. So it's above and beyond what MDOT will cover for the, the roundabouts. And then for the US-127 West Avenue interchange, it's the $207,328.84 for the total of $513,087.04. Tony, you good? Elm Road, $187,000 plus. Mm -hmm. 
West Avenue, 207,000 plus. Uh-huh. That doesn't total 513, dollars Oops, I'm missing some. Hold on, let me go to the breakdown. The math doesn't Okay, work. and then on top of that is the um, engineering costs for MDOT. The construction total is the 394 that you were talking about, and then there's a... 60,000 in PE and 60,000 in CE to get us to that 513. Sorry about that. So that's for it because these are MDOT lot projects. So they're doing all the design work and all the construction engineering. So their inspection. So the 120,000 is for their project, for them to cover the project costs. 60 with their per, staff. per interchange, correct? Um, 60 for design and 60 for construction. Total for the two. They use 15%. Tony, additional? Nope, I got Okay. That's enough, thank you. Any other questions from the committee? <laughs> Phil? Comment. Yes. Like Microphone, please. <laughs> Seems like we could find more roads to fix instead of this. I mean, we've got a lot of money tied up in here. And looks nice and looks pretty, but is this what we're spending our road money on? Phil, in my opinion, do you want it to look like a prison, or do you want it look to look presentable to a point? It's where well, to uh, a people point. get their first impression of our county as they come in through those interchanges. And it's one of the reasons they've designed the overpasses to look a little more aesthetically pleasing instead of looking, nothing wrong with it, but looking like a prison. My opinion. Okay. And that was the opinion of the committee that met. We've been meeting over a series of meetings for a good year on this. And it's an improvement to welcome the people coming to Jackson and get them to want to come here and live here. And Angie, that, that committee is participation by county, city, state, and Blackman Township. Correct. correct? No. And I would note that Blackman has the 530000 they're putting in, and the city also has 470000 they're putting in. I understand. I, I understand that. Just it seems like after some of the tough times we've been through, we're spending kind of fat and happy to me. I just wonder how necessary this is. That's all. My opinion. Okay. Looking for a motion. There's support. Support. Motion and support. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. Motion carried. Send it on to the full board. One additional comment, if I may? Absolutely. Um, these new overpasses look nice. Uh, look better than just the plain concrete. Uh, the roundabouts and the uh, aesthetic treatment there looks nice. Um, what are we doing to protect these from being spray painted and becoming just plain ugly? Um, what are we doing to protect it? There, there is there are products on the market. One of them is called uh, graffiti block. Okay, yeah. uh, you can spray it on brick, cement block, concrete, on stained concrete. It doesn't change the color of anything. You can't tell it's been applied other than once somebody gets up there with a can of spray paint, the garden like hose, so. spray paint's gone. We will definitely bring that back to the committee and see if we can get that applied. If not, I'm sure that after the fact we can because um, we will do maintenance on the one nearest our office, so we can try to get that applied. You can do it after the fact, as long as you're quick enough to get there before the graffiti artists are. Right. We're hoping that people will take pride in that, put the graffiti on there. But Many will, Angie, but not everybody. <laughs> I know. It is an opportunity. Uh, okay, if no additional comments on that topic, we're down to the JC monthly report. Okay, I'll just highlight a few things in here. Um, when Mother Nature is allowing, our operations crew are out uh, doing some ditching work, culverts, water drainage. Um, on the state crew, we're out fixing the cable barrier guardrail and regular guardrails for the state that get damaged um, from winter accidents. Patching on 94. Um, uh, I'd like to highlight our storm uh, damage report that we've been doing. There's been a big push um, for communicating to the, the residents, and it's had a 
some great feedback. Uh, our crews were getting pictures as the damage is happening. Um, as you can see in the Smith Road picture there, and we're putting it out on our Facebook page to communicate to the, the public and creating that storm damage summary and updating it as roads uh, are shut or put caution signs out there um, or if we reopen them. So uh, kudos to the team for staying up on that during the storm events. Um, then for the engineering department, we're hard at work getting all of our projects in for the 2020 season. Uh, I'd highlight that the McDivitt Phase 1 plans were received at the end of the week last week, I believe Friday. So we hope to have them out on the streets for bidding by February 14th. Um, we have the Michigan Average that will be getting here soon. They said February. Uh, they're still waiting on their Amtrak permit. No surprise there. but. Um, and for our local projects, we have tree work going on right now for next year's projects. Um, the bids for the Blackman Spring Arbor, Couple Roads in Spring Arbor, and Summit projects are out. Um, and they will be back in the end of February for you guys to approve in March. Uh, and then for our permits, you'll see that our 2019 permits revenues went up. Um, that's a large part due to using Oxcart. Uh, I was just at a, a committee meeting and they were talking about Oxcart and that the industry loves it because it's very simple to apply for permits now. Um, so that almost, what, $70,000 additional costs are really from using Oxcart and consumers and them feeling the ease of submitting and getting them approved. And then lastly, our community outreach. Uh, we have the students from the Jackson Area Career Center um, that created a number of uh, different things for us, including the newsletters and the lift brochures for the county. So we're excited to have them. Any questions? Commissioners, any questions of Angie? No. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that takes us down to the claims, which I have not seen yet. Have those started to make their way around? Okay. Be looking for a motion to pay the claims. Motion and support. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed the same. Other minutes, there are none. The March reporting schedule, a number of reporters next month. Don't take any offense, Brad, but uh, it takes us back to public comments. Any public? Anybody at all? Nope. No public comment. Committee member comments. Hearing none, we're adjourned.